Thank you everyone for tuning into our webinar. Uh, my name is Sharon Cornelison and I'm the Director of Housing at the Consumer Federation of America. Uh, today in this webinar, we are talking about a growing uh, national problem across the United States. Um, as you all know, uh, over the last few years, homeowners insurance has, uh, has become much more expensive uh, for a lot of consumers. Uh, as a result, uh, more and more consumers can no longer afford uh, homeowners insurance. Um, they are forced to either cut back on other uh, essential expenses elsewhere, uh, they can go underinsured, or they are forced uh, to go without insurance altogether. Uh, this has become so common that there's even a popular term for this, uh, going bare, which means going without insurance uh, altogether. At CFA, uh, we've recently published a new report on this issue. Uh, relying on some of the best national data uh, that is out there, we documented this growing problem of uninsured homeowners nationwide. In this webinar, we will first share some of the main findings uh, of this report. Michael DeLong uh, from CFA will start us off with a 15 minute presentation. His overview will be followed by a moderated uh, conversation with national experts, including Doug Heller from CFA, uh, Caroline Nagy from Americans for Financial Reform, and Monica Palmera from the Greenlining Institute. I would like to thank my CFA co uh, colleague, Anne-Marie Lowery, for making this webinar possible. And we will leave time at the end for questions. So if you have a question uh, at any time, please type it in the chat. And uh, this webinar will also be recorded and the recording will be posted online uh, on YouTube afterwards. So that's it, Michael, uh, we'll get us started with, a, with an overview. All right. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, let me share my screen and I'm looking forward to talking with you all about our uh, report. Um, all right. Um, this is our, uh, again, my name is Michael DeLong. I'm a research and advocacy associate with Consumer Federation of America. Um, we're an association of consumer organizations. We work to advance consumer interests through research, advocacy, and education. Um, and today we're talking about our new report on a very important subject homeowners insurance, and specifically, uh, which consumers uh, lack this insurance coverage. Um, our report uh, sought to answer the following questions. Um, how many American households lack homeowners insurance? Uh, which households are more likely to lack homeowners insurance? Uh, what is their housing like? And where are the, ho the, home the households that lack homeowners insurance located? We also wanted to look at the question, ask the questions, what is the value of these uninsured homes? and what percentage of uninsured homes belong to Black and Hispanic homeowners. Um, here is a very short summary of our findings, uh, looking at income, demographics, age, location, and other qualities of the consumers that lack homeowners insurance. Uh, we will go through all these points in more detail, but this is a brief summary. We found that a lot of consumers lack homeowners insurance. Homeowners of color are disproportionately without coverage. So are rural homeowners and those living in Houston and Miami and a substantial amount of property value is not covered by homeowners insurance. This here is an example of the devastation that can be caused to homes by natural disasters and why homeowners insurance is needed. Uh, homeowners insurance, it's essential for protecting consumers. For most people, uh, homes are the largest purchases they will ever make by far and the largest assets that they will ever hold. And almost all mor mortgage issuers require homeowners insurance. And when disaster strikes an uninsured home, state and federal governments may provide some disaster relief in certain circumstances, but it is completely inadequate to cover a catastrophic loss uh, like the ones we see in this photo. Um, the maximum rebuilding grant from the Federal Emergency Management Agency is $42,500, uh, but as we detail in our report, the average payout from the agency is only about $3,500, which is the woefully inadequate to repair or replace a home. And in recent years, uh, premiums have been climbing in large part due to climate change and rising reinsurance costs. Um, over the past 25 years, uh, average annual uh, catastrophe losses have gone up 300%. And over the past 10 years, property and casualty reinsurance rates have gone up over 100%. And that is showing up on the bills for consumers. In just the past five years, homeowners insurance premiums have gone up by over 
And regulators have heard from consumers in their states, and we consumer advocates have heard them from them as well. More and more homeowners are struggling to pay uh, those premiums. Um, some are cutting back on coverage. And if premiums keep rising, many more homeowners may be forced to go bare, as my colleague Sharon said, meaning going completely without insurance. And without this insurance coverage, homeowners are solely responsible for repairing or replacing their homes. Um, uninsured homeowners face serious risks of losing uh, their homes, their finances, uh, almost everything. One major storm or fire uh, can turn an uninsured homeowner into an unhoused family or leave them living in the wreckage of a dangerous uh, damaged home that they can't afford to repair. So information about who lacks homeowners insurance is very important, but it hasn't been uh, rigorously studied and our report seeks to fill that gap. Um, our report analyzed a nationally representative data from the 2021 American Housing Survey and the American Community Survey. And the surveys provided information about the composition and quality of housing stock, information about housing expenses, including homeowners insurance, uh, the demographics of homeowners, and the geographic variation of people who lack homeowners insurance. Um, the survey responses were weighted to make sure that the estimates were representative, and we conducted a statistical analysis uh, to ensure that the results were robust. And our final exam sample included 31,669 observations. So what were our findings? Well, our first top our first our top finding was that in 2021, 6.1 million homeowners lacked homeowners insurance coverage. Um, that's equivalent to 7.4% of homeowners, or one in 13 homeowners across the United States. Um, we looked at older data and found that the national share of uninsured homeowners has been relatively stable over time. And as the data are from 2021, it, this data doesn't yet capture the impacts of rising premiums and insurance companies leaving disaster prone communities and some states altogether. Um, we expect that rising insurance premiums and diminishing access to homeowners insurance will cause more people to go without homeowners insurance in the years to come. Um, our report also found that lower valued homes are far more likely to lack homeowners insurance. Uh, as you can see here, 19% of homes valued at $150,000 or less are without coverage. By contrast, only 5% of homes worth uh, between $150,000 and $300,000 lack coverage. So a lower valued affordable housing is especially vulnerable and uh, their, its owners are especially at risk. And since the owners of these homes tend to be lower income, they usually have fewer savings and resources and they find it significantly more difficult to recover from uh, natural disasters. Um, we also found that older homes are more likely to be uninsured. Uh, as you can see here again, we discovered that homes built before the year 2000 are almost twice as likely to be uninsured compared to homes built in the last two decades. Uh, about 8% of homes built before 2000 lack homeowners insurance, and uh, about 5% of homes built after 2000 lack insurance. And older homes, they're, while they are often more affordable to lower income homeowners, they're also more likely to require expensive repairs or have maintenance issues caused by age and outdated infrastructure. Um, older homes, they also have a higher risk of falling into disrepair or facing costly damage caused by natural disasters because they're usually built based on older building codes without uh, upgrades or climate resiliency standards. Um, we also found that the type of uh, someone's home affects whether consumers lack insurance coverage. Um, again, as you can see here, owners of manufactured homes are by far the most likely to lack homeowners insurance. 35% of them are unprotected and going bare. Uh, by contrast, only 5% of single family homes lack insurance. And manufactured homes, they represent a significant and growing share of affordable housing stock. Uh, including for lower income families and older adults, as well as in rural areas. Um, additionally, owners of manufactured homes, they rarely own the land on which these structures are located, and they're less likely to have mortgages compared to uh, other homeowners. Um, next, uh, we found that most uninsured homeowners have no mortgage. Uh, they have either paid off their mortgage or never bought the home uh, with a mortgage. Um, only 2% of homeowners with a mortgage reported having no homeowner's insurance uh, compared to 14% of homeowners uh, without a mortgage who reported having no homeowner's insurance. 
And this is unsurprising because almost all mortgage lenders require homeowners to buy and maintain this coverage. Um, regarding the 2% of homeowners with a mortgage and no insurance, what we think is going on is that they are paying for a property insurance product that's called force-placed or lender-placed insurance. Um, these policies, they often provide only single interest coverage. And what that means is that they only protect the mortgage lender and not the homeowner. But the cost is paid by the homeowner through an insurance charge on their mortgage bill. And so we think they likely don't recognize it as insurance when they respond uh, to the surveys. Um, unsurprisingly, we also found that homeowners with lower incomes are more likely to lack insurance. Um, 15% of consumers who make uh, less than $50,000 a year are without coverage. And by contrast, only uh, four, about 4% 4 of consumers who earn $50,000 to $149,999 are without coverage. And of people who earn more than $150,000, uh, only 2.5% only of them lack coverage. And when we break down homeowners according to whether they live in poverty, we find that 22% of homeowners living in poverty lack homeowners insurance, and only 6% of homeowners not in poverty lack insurance. So lower income homeowners, they're much more likely to have no mortgage, leaving them the option to forego homeowners insurance. And homeowners who are among the least likely to have the financial resources to pay for unexpected damage, they're the most likely to be unprotected. Um, we also found that uh, race, there are big racial and ethnic inequalities in who does not have insurance. 14% um, uh, of uh, Hispanic homeowners don't have in insurance, 11% uh, of Black homeowners, and 22% uh, of Native American homeowners do not have insurance. So those are some very large racial and ethnic disparities. And we found that, among other things, uh, Hispanic homeowners are more than twice as likely as white homeowners to not have homeowners insurance. And this is especially worrisome because uh, many communities of color are disproportionately uh, exposed and susceptible to natural disasters. Their neighborhoods may be in more vulnerable locations, uh, and they likely don't have as many resources to recover, and they may not get as much attention from uh, disaster relief agencies. Um, next, we found that older adults are more likely to not have homeowners insurance, uh, except among uh, white households. Um, these are some pretty striking disparities as well. They illustrate how older homeowners, uh, Black homeowners, uh, Hispanic homeowners, um, Asian American Pacific Islander homeowners uh, are more vulnerable and they go without homeowners insurance. Uh, older homeowners tend to have less time to recover from natural disasters. They also tend to often deal with mobility issues or health challenges, and many of them live on limited and fixed incomes, uh, such as Social Security. And so accidents or disasters often jeopardize their ability to stay in their homes as they age in place. And these uh, insurance gaps uh, are deepening racial wealth and home ownership gaps as well. Um, and uh, uninsured homeowners are found across the country. Uh, this issue can't just be reduced to a handful of states or regions. Uh, but in certain areas, homeowners are much more likely to lack insurance. Uh, we found uh, that rural homeowners are more likely than urban and suburban homeowners to be uninsured. 12% of rural homeowners lack homeowners insurance compared to the national average of 7.4%. And from the major metropolitan areas where we have data, we found that the highest share of uninsured homeowners were in uh, Miami, 15%, uh, Houston, 10%, and Detroit, uh, 9%. And um, both uh, Miami and Houston are very vulnerable to climate disasters, especially hurricanes and storms and other things. And in Miami, uh, average homeowners insurance costs are already in thousands of dollars per year and even higher for uh, many folks. So overall, an enormous amount of housing wealth is unprotected by homeowners insurance. Uh, we estimate that $1.6 trillion in uh, homeowners home value is without coverage. And of that, 339 billion worth of these homes are owned by Hispanic households. 206 billion are owned by black households. Those are gigantic amounts by any measure. And that's a lot of risk to be taking. Um, and here, finally, here are the states with the largest percentages of uninsured homeowners. And our report has a chart that lists all the states and the percentages of uninsured homeowners. 
you can see here at the top of the list are Mississippi and New Mexico, where 13% of homeowners lack homeowners insurance. Both of these states have low median incomes and significant rural populations, and those are factors that likely impact uh, the relatively high percentages of, uh, of uninsured homeowners. Um, next up uh, comes Louisiana, where 12% of homeowners lack coverage, and Louisiana, again, has a relatively low incomes, a lot, significant rural populations, and it's also very vulnerable to natural disasters. Um, West Virginia has 11%. Uh, and Alaska has 11%, North Dakota as well. Again, all of these states are vulnerable. And um, Florida and Texas also have uh, significant numbers of uninsured uh, homeowners. And that means, and because they have so many people living in those states, it basically means that uh, they are uh, vulnerable as well. And the problem is especially significant there. So we conclude with some policy recommendations that are outlined uh, in greater detail in our report. Um, we er they include urging uh, insurance regulators to collect more data to track pre-existing and emerging inequalities in homeowners insurance markets and to promote data transparency. Uh, frankly, um, state insurance regulators have fallen down on the job. They haven't fulfilled their obligations. They haven't collected information on who lacks homeowners insurance or homeowners insurance in general or about uh, climate change and rising insurance costs. Recently, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners announced a proposed data call to collect information on homeowners insurance costs, which is an encouraging first step, but this should have been done years ago and it needs to become a regular fixture because we're going to need a lot of data to figure out what's going on. Uh, second, um, the states and federal government and other companies and communities should invest in risk reduction through mitigation measures. This can include uh, require providing grants to consumers to undertake measures to, say, harden their homes against wildfires or hurricanes. It could take the form of requiring insurance companies to give discounts to consumers who undertake these measures. Some states already have these uh, programs that are uh, giving grants or giving discounts, but every state should have these programs and existing programs need to be greatly expanded. Third, we urge that uh, there be a public reinsurance mechanism to reduce insurers' over-reliance on unregulated reinsurance. Reinsurance is basically insurance for insurance companies where they purchase it to spread the risk around and to guard against big uh, natural disasters and a flood of claims. Um, Representative Adam Schiff has a proposal to establish a federal reinsurance program called the Insure Act, which uh, Consumer Federation of America supports. Uh, but other proposals include like possibly state-run uh, reinsurance programs, several states coming together to combine their resources and create these programs or other reforms. And finally, uh, insurance regulators should conduct additional research on racial equity and the homeownership insurance gap because racism and racial discrimination in homeowners insurance are big problems. Our research suggests there are big gaps between who has homeowners insurance and who does not. And those gaps often are the result of racial bias, at least in part. And we need more information to determine how serious this problem is and to figure out how to solve it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, looking forward to the rest of the webinar and the discussion. We'll try to answer your questions. Uh, and if we do not, you should please feel free to reach out to me at mdelong at consumerfed.org, uh, where I'm happy to talk and answer any questions or anything else. Thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Sharon. Thank you so much, Michael. That was a great summary uh, of our, in 15 minutes, so all our findings, or almost all our findings in our, in our report. So thank you for that. So I'd like to turn to our panel discussion now. And as a reminder, uh, we will leave some time at the end for questions uh, from the audience. So if you have uh, a question, uh, please type it uh, in the chat and we'll get to it at the end of our Q&A. Uh, so the first question that I have for our panelists is why now? Like, why is this happening now? Uh, you know, what has changed to homeowners insurance in the last few years and why are we seeing this crisis now? So I, I will start with, with Doug, but I'm asking it to all our three panelists here. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Michael, for the presentation. And to all of you, thanks for joining us in this conversation. Um, I, I mean, I think that we have seen uh, uh, essentially the explosion of a crisis uh, across the American, uh, you know, the, the land, the entire landscape of the, of the nation where insurance companies are uh, for really the first time starting to 
uh, recognize the impact of climate change and, and growing climate risk on the uh, book of business that they have, and they're trying to kind of taking action, taking action on their own. And uh, what's happening is rather than having kind of a long-term process that began 20 years ago when many consumer advocates started going to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners and going to regulators and companies and saying, hey, we need to think about the impact of climate change on risk, on underwriting, and on the prices that will be charged. Uh, carriers who had kind of ignored that for so long so very, very recently have said, okay, we're now going to integrate that into our, our, our planning, our decision-making, and our underwriting. And it's coming like a shock to so many uh, homeowners and communities throughout the country and regulators too. And I think that, that that's sort of why this has become such a, um, a nationalized issue where we're hearing about it from so many different sectors because it really has happened all at once. There, there was no um, kind of transition or phasing of a, of a challenge or kind of process of, of adapting. This was just like somebody snapped their fingers and suddenly we're all uninsurable. Now, of course, that's not the case, but we are dealing with really uh, significant changes in uh, the needs to transfer risk for properties around the country because climate change has, can, has continued to exacerbate the exposure that we all have. And so that's part of it. I think part of it is obviously climate change has been driving things um, for a long time and that the insurance industry kind of has reacted fairly suddenly, which is kind of not in line with the process of climate change. But then also, and Michael mentioned this, we have seen an explosion of reinsurance costs. Now the reinsurance market is a global unregulated market and the companies that do this business, they're not dedicated um, to uh, United States or local communities, um, even in the way that the regular insurance companies are, they serve um, our you know, various communities. The reinsurance market, they're just, they're just looking to where's the best, most profitable place to deploy their capital. And those rates have gone up so high and the insurance companies that have to pay those high rates are generally passing them on to consumers. And that's been a real pain. And so then the, the, the final piece of sort of why we're thinking about this now is these decisions that people have to make. And I don't even think we see the full scale of the um, uninsured homeowners uh, uh, situation in this data. Because this data, as we point out in the report, is from 2021. New data from 2023 will be available soon. And it's really over the last two years that we've seen these price spikes and these underwriting changes, which are have companies walking away from homes, communities, and sometimes entire states. And I'm, I'm really concerned that we're going to actually see a dramatic increase in the data when we rerun mm -hmm. the American Housing Survey data that's going to show this change since the last couple of in the last couple of years due to the spiking rates as well as the uh, insurance company withdrawals. So I just think that we have a real we have a real crisis on our hand and it's nationwide as is the climate crisis. And uh, that's why this is getting is the attention that it does deserve. Yeah, great, great answer, Doc. Um, Caroline and, and Monica, I'm giving you a chance to elaborate on that. Carol, Caroline goes next. Uh, thanks. Um, everything that Doug said, um, you know, the, uh, I completely agree with. And then um, two other factors, I think, that are really um, pushing the price of insurance up. One is um, the fact that we um, are living through an unprecedented affordable housing crisis. And so our housing is actually becoming more and more valuable every day, um, even though we don't necessarily get to benefit um, from that. But that actually makes it more expensive to insure. And then inflation. So um, it's actually more expensive now to repair a home, both in terms of the cost of materials and in terms of the labor costs. Um, and so all of these things um, are wound together. And I just see um, a comment in the chat asking about fraud. I do not think um, that anyone, I do not, I have not seen any evidence to indicate that people have become all of a sudden um, significantly more fraudulent in recent years than past. I think um, there's a pretty baseline level of fraud there. Um, I think it is a scapegoat uh, to avoid accountability from insurers for their behavior. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me uh, for this very, very important topic. Um, and I appreciate the question about why now. Um, I think that I want to acknowledge that um, what y'all point out in the paper that's so important that obviously that um, uh, Hispanic communities, Black communities, and Native American communities are experiencing this insurance crisis disproportionately. And I think that we understand that there has been rampant racism in the insurance industry for long before this particular crisis. We know that there has been 
you know, race-based premiums and redlining in this industry. So communities have been feeling this crisis for a really long time. I think what's happening now is that it's starting to affect other kinds of neighborhoods, uh, maybe second home neighborhoods and others a little bit more acutely. And therefore, we see the headlines talking about it a little bit more. But that's not to diminish that this really is a climate fueled crisis um, and one that obviously as the climate crisis gets worse and worse, we're starting to have to really grapple with this in real time. Um, so I think that's part of why we're starting to see this now. I think there's a, a combination of just how widespread um, the insurance crisis is, but I again wanted to acknowledge sort of the deep roots of this crisis in certain communities that are particularly climate vulnerable. Sharon, right. could I, if I could just add one uh, one thing, is just sort of following on something Caroline said, which I think is important. It's a little bit technical, but I think it really matters because clearly the risk has increased. I think we all agree with that, and I'm sure we'll talk about how important it is to kind of focus on reducing risk. We can't just price our way out of this problem. But one thing that I've been noting over the last several months, because we continue to see insurance companies pushing for higher and higher rates, um, more and more withdrawals and things like that, even as inflation, and Caroline mentioned inflation sort of driving and inflation has been a factor, but inflation has come down significantly from that 2022, um, early 2023, when we were talking about 9% inflation in basically all aspects of the economy except insurance. I think the insurance industry is behind the inflation curve a bit and they like it there because they're pricing rates as though we're still going to see those 9% inflation um, rates going into the future. So we're all paying for that. So I just want to note that there, that not all of this is simply, well, that's just the world we live in now. Insurance costs more. That's part of it. But we also have to recognize that there are regulatory, the regulatory oversight of the industry um, and the kind of a political bullying that we're seeing from insurance companies who are saying, if I don't get the rate I need, we're going to drop your customers, really, I think, plays into this. And I think a lot of regulators have been cowed into kind of giving everything the insurers want, even when it may be going beyond. One, one company said, we're going to catch up to inflation. We might even overshoot. We don't want to overshoot, but we might overshoot. And indeed, I think that they have overshot a bit. So I just want to keep in mind the fact that some of this all can be contained through better oversight of the companies as well. And we need to see that because regulators have not been as aggressive with the carriers as the carriers have been with consumers. Great, uh, thank you. I, I appreciate how we're, we're getting into these very complex issues from the very beginning. But before we go deeper, I, I do want to sort of ground this discussion sort of at the level of the, the consumer and the experience of the consumer. So this, might, this question is for Caroline. Why is homeowners insurance so important for consumers? Why does it matter that they, that they have homeowners insurance? Well, thank you, Sharon. Yeah, I think um, that's a it's a great question. And um, one, I think it's really important to spell out the ramifications. So um, if you are a homeowner who has a mortgage, having property insurance is a requirement for fulfilling your you know, responsibilities as a borrower. And if um, as insurance prices become more and more expensive, obviously, we can expect to see more and more people struggling to afford it. When you, um, when you, if you stop paying um, property insurance for your property insurance and you have a mortgage, your lender will impose what is known as forced place insurance, um, as, um, as uh, Michael uh, described earlier in his presentation on you, um, which is basically they're just, they're going to pay it and they're going to charge you for it. And um, you can assume that uh, a borrower is going to pay handsomely for that. So um, if they were initially experiencing any kind of financial difficulties, um, this is just going to continue to spiral and make it worse. So that is, um, see, so yeah, I mean, I think the, the, uh, there's, a, there's a very clear risk of um, falling into default and then ultimately foreclosure due to um, not uh, paying um, property insurance. Now, for folks who don't have a mortgage, um, you know, there's no no one is requiring um, you to get property insurance, but clearly um, it is a very good idea to get property insurance because um, disasters uh, uh, and even severe weather um, are becoming more and more uh, regular. I had a tree branch fall onto my porch um, over the weekend uh, just because of an unusually windy um, ice storm. You know, and so, and that's, and there was, I would like to, I'm pointing that out because that wasn't, um, I don't think that was declared a disaster. And so that meant that I wouldn't be able to get disaster assistance from FEMA. 
Because I think that's the one thing. If you don't have homeowner's insurance and your property is damaged in a declared disaster, you are able to get FEMA emergent, disaster emergency assistance. However, it is um, quite low uh, and nowhere near um, enough to fully cover the costs of, um, uh, of repairing your home. I think it's currently, the FEMA limits are $42,500 for housing assistance, $42,500 for other needs assistance. That's clearly not, that's not even gonna really, that's not gonna replace a roof anymore um, or most of them. So uh, yeah, um, I think we do have, uh, we do have the disaster assistance um, system, but like it's important to know that that is no, nowhere near um, going to get um, folks uh, what they need to actually recover and move on and from, from a disaster. Right, yeah, Doug, you can jump in. Yeah, I, I just, it, it drew out a thought in me that I think is really important. One, of course, to the question, uh, you know, for those of us, those who follow the work that Consumer Federation of America does, we're often criticizing the behavior of insurance companies and the regulation, but we are deep believers in the value of insurance. It's really important. We think of it as a critical tool to economic security, community resilience. And so we think that, that that's very important, but it's also important, you know, um, to av help avoid blight in the in the wake of disasters and, and or even problems. Um, so I think that's very important to just recognize that the reason we're fighting so hard to make sure that we're aware of how much uh, the how uh, severe the lack of coverage is, is because we really want to make sure that people have the protection they need in order to live out their best lives and not find themselves in the kind of that disaster situation that we all observed when we watched the um, exodus from New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and such. But the other thing that I wanted to note, because I think we have a tendency to think about this as a crisis on the coasts, whether it's a California crisis or a Gulf Coast or, uh, you know, mid-Atlantic kind of crisis. If you look at the catastrophe data from the insurance industry, the vast majority of losses in the United States have nothing to do with wildfires or hurricanes, but have to do with these severe storms and hailstorms that happens kind of from the northern part of Texas and then up through the middle of the country. That's why in many some of the most expensive insurance premiums in the country are in Nebraska, right? And I think that that's very uh, surprising to people, but I think it's a, a recognition and why this is not just a state issue, but also a national issue, that we are facing a, uh, a, a crisis of a natural disaster kind of related insurance crisis throughout the country. And we sort of, sort of fool ourselves if we say, oh, well, it's just wild wildfires in California or... Um, hurricanes in Florida and Louisiana. So I think it's really important to recognize that folks are having ice storm damage, as Caroline suggested, and hail storm damage in Eastern Colorado and derechos going up through Iowa. I mean, this is a severe problem that's nationwide and I just can't yeah. emphasize that enough. No, and yeah, exactly. And it may mean that the most vulnerable homeowners may be forced to live with unsafe conditions because they cannot uh, afford uh, to fix their porch or their roof, right? Uh, and families have to live in these unsafe conditions, right? So there's a lot of kind of downstream consequences uh, that, that people are uh, exposed to. It. And, and it's mostly the homeowners that are already most vulnerable and, and sort of lower income as well. Um, so in this report, we uh, found that $1.6 trillion in home value is currently exposed. Uh, but this number only includes uh, the homes owned by homeowners uh, across the country, it does not include uh, rental rental you know property like the 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 prop the possessions that the renters have in in homes. Uh, nor does it include multifamily uh, apartments, right? So, um, Caroline, you know, you know what is happening in those markets? What what you know what parallels do you see in the in the multifamily uh, space, for example? Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think um, first of all for renters. Um, you know, renters are especially vulnerable following declared disasters, which, as we've discussed, is not, you know, the only type of way properties get damaged uh, because, you know, FEMA disaster assistance mostly exists to make property to fix people's property. And so um, renters tend to uh, really not uh, because, yeah, they don't own the home that they live in. They don't you know, qualify for that. Also, um, generally, the first thing that happens after any kind of disaster is um, that a lot of that there's usually um, a, a severe affordability crisis as fo as wealthier folks as wealthier homeowners move into rental housing while they're replacing or repairing their damaged homes 
And, um, you know, there's very, very, very little um, to support uh, renters. And in fact, we have seen, um, you know, uh, I think a group out in Paradise, California, uh, it surveyed um, folks living on the streets in Chico, California, and found out that something like a third of them um, had been displaced by um, the recent fires. So this is a very real phenomenon um, that just feeds into our general affordable housing and um, homelessness crisis, which is a humanitarian disaster um, every single day in this country. Um, but yes, yeah, so to kind of go back to the insurance, um, we, we are seeing, um, you know, we're seeing rate increases that are just as bad, if not worse, um, for multi, the multifamily housing sector. It gets less attention because homeowners are a much more politically important um, class, a uh, powerful class nationally. And um, because that is, you know, the majority of our housing stock in the US. Um, but yeah, we're seeing, um, yeah, we're, we're seeing very big um, rate increases. So for example, the New York Housing Conference uh, recently surveyed its members who build specifically affordable housing. And they're finding that their insurance premiums are increasing an average of 26% annually while the coverage is actually decreasing or even difficult to find. Um, today, the average cost to insure an affordable apartment for a year is $1,770, which is a 103% um, increase from four years ago when the average annual per unit premium um, was significantly lower. And I think, you know, we really need to connect the what's happening um, with our insurance crisis, you know, our climate crisis and our housing crisis, because what is, you know, um, the things that are happening on the insurance market are actually making it very difficult to nearly impossible to actually impossible to manage affordable housing. And if we, you know, and I think, as I've said, affordable housing um, in climate safer areas is desperately needed if we are going to, um, you know, find a, find a way out of this um, situation. And unfortunately today, um, affordability press pressures are actually making things worse. We see more and more folks leaving, um, you know, climate safer areas and moving further into harm's way due to affordability pressures, whether it's, you know, let's say a San Francisco teacher who can't afford to live, who has to go live up in the hills out in fire country and commute an hour a day, or um, immigrant uh, family living in Queens that are forced to rent, um, down, you know, uh, illegal and unsafe basement apartments that uh, put their lives at risk when New York City has heavy rain. So I think, you know, this is, yeah, this is a, this is a very, very um, disturbing trend. And I think one more thing on um, the affordable housing in particular, I mean, as Monica was discussing around, um, you know, prejudice, uh, we are seeing in New York state, um, a refusal of insurers to um, insure uh, properties where section eight voucher holders live under um, what seems to be spurious reasoning that, um, you know, uh, that they are um, more dangerous, um, they will uh, cause more damage to the property, despite um, every study I've seen um, finding kind of the opposite for Section 8 voucher holders. Um, and, you know, just pulling out, refusing to lend entirely. Now, we know that there's, you know, an industry-wide, not nationwide practice of insurers pulling out but we also know the history of the insurance industry in this country and their um, role in redlining. And so, um, you know, it's, you know, I think um, one could look at this and be very concerned, you know, that there's inappropriate, um, you know, racial bias uh, impacting insurer decisions um, in that area. Thank you, uh, Caroline. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you bringing it up because it sort of it goes to, towards my next question, uh, which is for Monica. Um, so, uh, you've written, you've talked about blue lining uh, before. So can you explain a little bit more what blue lining is and how it's impacting uh, the most vulnerable consumers uh, in particular? Absolutely. I uh, appreciate a chance to plug another report in the, in the chat. Appreciate the chance to do that. Um, uh, so we kind of came across this issue of blue lining um, as we were actually thinking more about climate risk in the banking industry and in terms of availability of a broad set of financial services for, for communities. And what blue lining means or essentially uh, is, is uh, financial institutions, whether that's an insurance company, more uh, bank, any kind of mortgage lender, anything, credit provider, pulling back the availability of financial services as a direct result of climate risk or climate vulnerability. So the term blue came historically from, from flood risk, but we're really thinking about it in a more broad climate risk um, situation. And 
we started hearing about um, sort of this phenomenon happening very anecdotally of folks understanding like, oh, in certain areas that are more climate vulnerable, they're not, you know, folks aren't lending there, folks are doing less business there. Um, and why that's disturbing to us in particular is uh, as folks uh, clearly recognize and alluding to a lot of the themes we've already been talking about. We know that because of historic patterns of discrimination, the communities that are most climate vulnerable are disproportionately low income and communities of color. And therefore, we're very concerned that this protraction of financial services is going to be felt first and worst in these very communities. And so the communities that really need these financial services most to be able to weather the climate crisis um, are not going to have access to those services. And so the report that I um, just put in the chat, we just identify some very early warning signs. And the first domino that's so clear to see is this insurance crisis. Um, and we're starting to hear, you know, folks potentially having to sell their homes over their insurance costs in, in you know, historically Latino communities, um, community-based organizations not able to insure their community buildings as a result of climate risk. Uh, that what they're being quoted from from their insurance company. And so we're starting to see these patterns of climate financial discrimination happening in lower income communities of color. And of course, not only does this have the downstream impacts that we've been talking about, folks not being able to recover from disaster, losing any toehold into generational wealth, but the upstream uh, financial risks of this. So any opportunity we may have to close the racial wealth gap by getting more folks into home ownership um, opportunities not there if folks can't access insurance and the only house they can afford is in a climate vulnerable area that folks won't insure. Um, and, you know, uh, any ability to access credit um, being, you know, uh, foreclosed as a result of that climate risk. So that's a, you know, this this nexus uh, is something that we're really concerned about. And obviously this is, this is an issue across our whole society, but we really believe there needs to be special attention paid from insurance regulators as well as from banking and other financial regulators to how this impacts this, uh, historically disinvested communities, because these are the communities ultimately that did not create this climate crisis and are going to be feeling not only the very physical, scariest possible outcomes, but also the financial ones uh, are likely to be on their backs. And if we can do anything to stop that, that's what we'd like to do. And Sharon, if, if I could add something that's just, it's kind of not the opposite side of it, but just a, a different point that I think is lifted up by this conversation. We talked about the lack of access to coverage, especially in, uh, in communities of color or in financially vulnerable communities. But we've been talking about it in the disaster setting, you know, when the climate disaster hits. The vast majority of homeowners insurance claims have nothing to do with a climate disaster. They have to do with a, with a kitchen fire or a, um, you know, something like a, a damage, uh, you know, a, a theft or something like that, something that is small, parochial, that is localized to that individual homeowner. And I think it's really important to remember that it's not just sort of the the, the, the mass disaster problems that people will have to deal with. It's their own individual for which there will be less attention, there won't be FEMA, there won't be all of these other things, but the same impact can be there. If I can't repair my home because I don't have the insurance, then that cycle that, that, that Monica was talking about begins even without the climate disaster. So I, do, I don't want to lose, obviously climate is such an important part of this whole discussion, but I don't want to lose the just the economic, uh, fight, the critical financial tool that insurance is just for every day getting on and keeping that home in, in good order and, in, uh, you know, in the family, as it were. So I just wanted to add that because I think we don't want to miss that piece. No, and, and that's what I really appreciate about uh, writing the reports uh, with Doug, with you and Michael, and then also this conversation. It's like we're bringing together the expertise of sort of the insurance uh, advocacy and housing advocacy. And it's it's uh, insurance increasingly uh, shapes, like also who is able to build intergenerational wealth through home ownership, right? Which has become such a key part of thinking about the black white wealth gap, right? But if if home ownership doesn't lead to wealth, then you know what are we doing? So we have to really tackle uh, not just down payment assistance and you, you know, um, but also this insurance gap as sort of a rising, growing problem. Um, so talking about uh, you know, housing and insurance. Uh, as a housing advocate, uh, one thing that has sort of mystified me about uh, when I learning about the insurance industry is that there's just not that much data uh, available. I mean, you know, this is why our report was sort of uh, is sort of new because uh, we kind of found data uh, in American Housing Survey, but it's it's not it's kind of hard. So I, I wanted to ask uh, Caroline, mm. uh, as a fellow housing advocate. 
you know, what is what is the different? What, what what have you seen as a difference in data availability in housing and in insurance? And and why is it important that we have data about uh, insurance as well? Well, thanks, Sharon. I mean, I think this, yeah, the, the lack of data is a massive problem. Um, and so the reason that, um, you know, we can, we have a lot more data on housing is because, um, how, you know, we we regulate mortgage lending at the federal level, and we have the Home, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, affectionately or not referred to as HUMDA, um, by housing, housing folks, um, that actually like lets you get a really clear sense of who's lending, who's applying, who's being denied, where the mortgage lending is happening. Um, insurance, however, uh, is um, regulated at the state level. And there was actually a federal law, um, pre-war, uh, World War II federal law here in Ferguson that um, actually prevents the federal government from regulating insurance. So while we have like one, you know, um, one regulation for mortgage disclosure reporting um, nationally, we have 54 different insurance regulators, um, including you know the ter uh, U.S. territories as well, and um, you know things are very very different depending on which state you're in. If you're in a state like California, there are considerable consumer protections um, that prevent a, a lot of the price gouging, um, you know uh, that we've seen. Um, well, price gouging is a little bit loaded term, uh, extreme price increases that we've seen, um, you know, in other states. Um, and um, I think one of the things is like to know is that the uh, insurance industry has always been extremely secretive and unwilling um, to disclose their their data, how they're, um, you know, how they're calculating risks, um, what factors they're using, because, they, you know, they'll argue that it's like a trade secret. So um, as, you know, I mean, you have a very, very different state um, approaches to this, uh, to this issue. Um, I think in Texas, uh, they decided that their problem was, was that it wasn't climate change, it was um, woke capitalism. So they made like being woke in insurance illegal and somehow it didn't actually solve anything, um, you know, in terms of um, people, insurers continuing to depart and prices going up. Um, one thing that came out of the 2008 financial crisis, which of course was mostly a mortgage crisis, but we had, you know, the American Insurance Group or AIG collapsing, is that um, Dodd-Frank actually, for the first time, created a federal office um, under the U.S. Treasury called the Federal Insurance Office, and um, actually gave that office subpoena power over insurers in the country. Like, Obviously, the Federal Insurance Office can't directly regulate, but they at least had subpoena power, data collection power, that kind of thing. And um, myself and a number of other folks have been working, um, advocating with the Federal Insurance Office to do a data call to get a national picture of what's happening um, you know, on, with property insurance, because it's so important and is clearly um, a pressing issue of critical national importance. Um, following um, extense, uh, considerable industry pushback, um, the Federal Insurance Office um, opted to uh, not do the uh, data call originally as planned um, of insurers nationwide, but instead work with um, the uh, NAIC, National Association of Insurance Commissioners, to um, do something a little bit uh, different and voluntary. Um, and uh, safe to say, we're still kind of getting details on like what, can, what we can expect from that data call, which is more of an industry kind of voluntary um, thing. But we know already that a number of really important key states, um, red coastal states specifically, <laughs> don't expect much exactly, yeah, um, aren't participating. And I don't think um, we can say what's happening um, with the national insurance um, picture without knowing what's going on in Louisiana, Texas, and Florida, because they're really important. Um, so yeah, um, I, you know, um, we would rather, uh, the federal insurance office use the subpoena power that they have to actually get this data. Uh, but we're going to be keeping on this, um, for a while. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add on the. Thank data. you, Carol. I, I do want to kind of get to the All right. questions from you. I, I know Doug, I'm sure you have more to say about and I, but, uh, I, I just want to ask one final question, uh, and then I'm going to turn to some questions from the audience. And uh, that question is, well, you know, what are what are possible solutions? I know it's a big, big question, but just you know, uh, you know, what can we, what can we do? What are possible policy solutions? Um, 
I guess in in one in one or two minutes <laughs> max uh, to kind of address this address this problem. Just kind of a I, I'm just gonna keep it to a, a lightning round. Uh, Doug, do you want to start on that, and then we'll, we'll you know. Well, I'll be very quick, and I think we outline in our report we talk about the real the importance first of all of uh, taking on of the data collection. Though I will agree entirely with Caroline as she said as she described it. Um, so that's important. Um, we really do think we have to resolve the reinsurance, uh, the 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 market failure in the reinsurance sector because we think that that is a, a huge part of the pressure that's uh, on the uh, that's on the insurance market. But you know, as we do with the insure as the insure act proposes, and hopefully that um, will have a chance to get hearings. Um, we certainly think it deserves it. Uh, we want to make sure that any any opportunity given to insurers to find a more affordable reinsurance market comes partnered with insurance companies doing a better job of serving communities, including by offering a policy that is more comprehensive rather than shrinking policies, which has been going on for the last several decades, but making a policy that is more effective, as well as uh, providing relief that's really targeted, especially to low income consumers to make sure that everybody can participate in the home ownership op, you know, dream as it were. And so, uh, you know, I think that those are really important. And then, as I said earlier, and I will say until I'm blue in the face, we have got to be investing in risk reduction and mitigation because we can't, even, even if there was um, insurance companies get, were given the right to price whatever they wanted and consumers had the money to pay for it, we're not gonna be able to price ourselves out of what's driving this, which is that climate, a growing climate risk. And we have to invest in at the property level and the community level in reducing risk through a whole variety of means. And I'll, we'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Caroline, oh, okay. sure. <laughs> Caroline and then Monica, yeah. All right, thanks. Um, so this is an insurance crisis. Um, it is a national crisis, but this is also a housing crisis because an uninsurable home, you know, is a, a home you can't really live in. Um, you can't invest in, you know, can't take out a loan to make repairs on. And we've actually seen what happens um, when you cut off communities um, from financial services and it's redlining. And in fact, you know, some of the folks who live in redlined communities, as a result of um, being deprived of those financing opportunities, their housing is in worse condition. Um, we need, yeah, we need to, um, we need a national housing, housing and insurance and climate strategy that concentrates climate friendly housing in climate safer areas. Obviously, no area is completely safe, but there are better and worse areas for it. Um, we need much higher, um, and this is obviously an issue of state and uh, local, you know, zoning, um, but we really need to stop building homes in dangerous places. That should be obvious, but we're actually still doing that. Um, and we need to adopt much stronger uh, standards for new construction uh, to make uh, new housing much more resilient rather than um, you know, passing the buck on to the consumer who then has to pay for much more costly retrofits. And this is an issue that Americans for Financial Reform, where I work, has been working um, to convince the USDA, um, FHA, and FHFA to insist on these um, more resilient uh, standards as uh, a requirement for financing for new construction. And um, yeah, they absolutely need to be doing this, um, uh, you know, as an, uh, just another, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll let it go, Monica. Uh, plus one, everything everybody said, and clearly we need like a whole, a whole suite of solutions to tackle the multifaceted problem, but like plus one on the transparency, we have to understand how some of these underwriting models are happening and understand if there are sort of patterns of discrimination there that we can identify, because right now it's you know, we can do it on the on the from the outside, but we really need that transparency. We need the insurance commissioners and the federal insurance office to step up on that. Um, on sort of the engagement and investment piece, like agree with Doug on the absolute need for investment and resilience, and we need the insurance industry to do that investment. So we're really interested in thinking about what does a community reinvestment act for the insurance industry look like to have them also step up and invest their dollars in improving the resilience of communities, um, as well as you know where there are already existing programs that allow for some premium relief in exchange for uh, home hardening and safeguarding. So how can we scale that up in a really meaningful way where folks are able to put some of those measures in place? And I also wanna make a quick plug for um, targeted subsidies. At some point, we're gonna have to put some more money here. And obviously we have to think about, you know, 
moral hazard and how we account for people making choices about where they live. But there needs to be some consideration for the folks that are are going to have undue or you know disproportionate amount of impact based on this crisis. And how do we specifically target subsidies for those folks so they can stay in their homes? Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot more uh, that, that can be addressed in just one hour. So I have a question here from Carlos Horn from the audience, and they ask, well, you know, what's what's exactly the state role in regulating insurance, and what can states do to to regulate insurance and advocates advocate for consumers? So I'm going to let Doug uh, go on this one. Sure. I, so as as Caroline said earlier, going back to the 1940s, uh, federal law kind of uh, referred regulation of insurance to the states and the state's the state um, own regulation of insurance. It's really, um, there's very, li very little done at the national level. And so each state has its own set of insurance laws and they vary widely, including the mechanism of, by which an insurance company can go into market with, with uh, changed rates. Do they have to um, seek an approval from a regulator before they do that by demonstrating and justifying their rate changes? Or can they just go into the market and sell whatever they want and then file some documentation afterwards? There's a whole range around the country of that. And with that comes a range of res outcomes for consumers. Uh, CFA has studied the regulatory regimes around the country, specifically in the auto insurance market. And we found much better results for consumers when states require insurance companies to justify their rates before they go to market with new rates. So that's called prior approval. Um, and, and so that's part of it. We've also seen um, opportunities in, uh, in California. There's an opportunity for consumers to so speaking about how can consumers be involved. There's an opportunity for consumers to participate in rate challenges. And some new research has shown that when insurance companies go for rate increases in California, um, if, a, if a public member, a consumer group, for example, does not get involved, the insurance regulator tends to give the insurance company or allow them to charge about 95 to 98 percent of what they originally requested. But when consumer advocates get involved and bring their own experts and actuaries, the rate that eventually gets charged is about 70 percent of what was originally requested. So ensuring that there is more accountability, not just for the insurance companies, but for the regulatory team that is involved with overseeing that is one way that we have seen success around the country, but it's unfortunately has been really limited to California. And there are some other places where there is more kind of um, rate payer advocacy that does happen. Um, and we should be increasing that. I mean, we should be demanding that our state lawmakers are opening up the process, not making it more and more secretive, which of course the insurers want. They want everything to show up and come in with a black box that nobody else can really see. So that's been really um, a bit of the challenge. And I think it goes to what Monica was saying that the regulators need to step up but the lawmakers also have to create the path for a stronger oversight of these carriers. Great, yeah. Um, another question here from uh, Jake Edwards. Uh, he says, I know from experience, it's hard or impossible for young adults to purchase homes nowadays. And it's not something we've, we've uh, talked much about. Like what, how does uh, rising, how do rising insurance rates impact, uh, you know, people's ability to buy their first home? Uh, Caroline, like, do you want to take this question? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, what's happening is that young people aren't buying homes right now unless um, they come from families with significant wealth. Um, average home price is somewhere around four hundred thousand um, dollars. So that would mean um, for a twenty percent down payment, you know, that's eighty thousand um, bucks. Most young, yeah, and I think most young people do not have eighty thousand um, dollars to buy a home. And um, also keeping in mind how high interest rates are currently, even though, you know, they're coming down a bit, um, you know, that really makes home financing prohibitively expensive. So um, clearly having an additional high monthly, you know, high additional extra cost of home ownership is not making the problem better. And I think this is, you know, really um, significant, you know, for folks um, who, yeah, are desperately trying to get into the market right now. Um, New York City last year, uh, I read something like 80% of property transactions were all cash for a city of, you know, um, 12 million people. So like you have to, you know, consider like, um, you know, that and also private equity, large institutional investors that are buying up homes. Um, you know, like it is, a, it's a terrible time to be a first time home buyer. I don't think, I, I, I would, I'm not really sure when it's been worse. So yes, it's bad and um, this doesn't help. Oh, yeah. I, oh, Monica, do you want to 
sort of have a no, I mean I I'll answer this. again I put in the chat and most of my like again relatively young home buying peer group is um especially a lot of my colleagues are in California and so many of them are get dropped at random times from their insurance company, have to ride forced placed insurance for a while until they can get another policy. And I think that that's something that's probably happening that's hard to approve. Is there a child in my background? There is. My children are breaking in. Um, but um, I think that's happening, as well as just folks being super delayed and being able to close because they can't get a policy in time. That's definitely happening as well. So I think even in folks are like, if folks aren't able to get that, they're not getting the mortgage to begin with. But even if they are, it's just drawing things out and costing folks. So that that dream becomes even more elusive. Right. Thank you. Thank you uh, all so much. I really uh, appreciate this wide ranging uh, discussion. I also appreciate the, the, the questions and comments uh, in the chat. Uh, very great to read. I cannot, uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, address all questions in, in our time. Uh, but yeah, we hope you you found our webinar informative. We hope to see you at a future CFA uh, webinar as well. And we'd just like to thank you uh, so much for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you all the panelists too. Thank, thank you. you all so much for listening. Thank you, Sharon and CFA for organizing this. Cool.